uh, the crazy thing is that all the kids are getting along and just having a great time, yeah. no matter what band's on. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, there's a lot of elitism or like, oh, I'm not going to listen to this because it's not, um, you know, this style of music or, you know, they don't wear white belts or whatever. But, like, everybody's just having a great time. It's like a, a very uh, real sense of camaraderie. The year is 2004. You unassumingly walk into a Hot Topic after being lured in by its gaudy dark sign in entryway. A stark contrast to the white bread American Eagle and prep infested layer of scent hell that is Hollister. You see a wall of t-shirts covered in cutesy looking monsters and unreadable logos. Only to find yourself coming face to face with the CD kiosk. In front of you lies a strange looking album. A CD with a couple embracing, but its art style is strange. After some convincing, your neglectful cigarette mom finally caves and buys it for you. And as you get home and thrust it into your CD player, it happens. No longer are you a normal kid who likes riding their bike and listening to Nirvana with their dad. You are now a fringe-laden skeleton, a creature the world doesn't understand. You are no longer like the other kids. You're kind of weird, and in a sense, you've become emo. At least, that's the way I like to imagine most people back in the day reacted to MCR. 2004 is quite possibly the most pivotal and important year for the band. The revenge era of My Chemical Romance is without a doubt their most iconic, and before you screech at me about my Black Parade, in terms of public consciousness, songs like Black Parade and Dead do sit among the band's most well-known and iconic. But when you mutter the name Gerard Way, or the acronym MCR, it's doubtful that you're thinking of the short blonde hair or drumline suits that the band wore during that time. No, rather this is what usually pops in people's heads. Long swoopy hair, a mixture of dress clothing and bulletproof vests, the red, white, and black color scheme, and that unmistakable sheen of mall goth aesthetics. This was, and for many, still is the iconic and memorable visage of the band even 20 years past. While Gerard and crew would obviously see even greater heights of success with both Black Parade and Danger Days, it was their sophomore record that would make them a household name, setting them onto the path to become one of the most influential acts of the 2000s. Pre Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, the majority of the bands in the burgeoning emo scene were far more scattered in terms of their looks and especially their sounds. You had sad alt-rock types like The Used, straight-up pop-punk acts like Sum 41, and probably most importantly the ever-infamous Fall Out Boy, who was fusing the old pop-punk sound with more contemporary post-hardcore and especially pop elements. But it was MCR who would be the ones to truly fit all the pieces together with the look, the message, and most importantly, the sound. And with all this, MyChem would take over the world and turn the at the time niche emo scene into the powerhouse it's remembered all these years later. So without further ado, why don't we take a dive into the revenge era of My Chemical Romance. There's been a couple times where I've I've been left at a I've been left at truck stops like and the band's kind of driven a couple miles down the road and I'd have to call them on my cell phone you know call them on the cell phone and it's like hey what's up and they're like hey how's it going man and I'm like you notice something's missing from the van and they kind of look around and they're like ah shit and then I have to turn around as covered in our previous exploration of the band's beginnings. MyChem had an interesting start to their career. Being birthed as a last ditch effort to make a genuinely captivating band that could take the world by storm and spark positive change in a post 9-11 world. 
2002's Bullets wasn't exactly a breakout success that shot the band into stardom, but it did put them on the map and give them not only a lot of credibility in the underground, but capture the attention of major record labels with its sleeper success and forward-thinking sound, something that come 2003 would pay off pretty well for the band. With bigger notoriety came tours with acts like The Used, Every Time I Die, and Avenge Sevenfold, each upcoming artists in their own right, and each offering a different demographic of fans for MCR to siphon from. And that's something that should be noted about the band, especially during this early juncture. Not only was My Chemical Romance a haven of eclectic and captivating personalities, but due to its cross of various influences and varied sounds, it allowed them to chameleon their way around and centralize much of the scattered audience of the Molgoth and emo scene of the early 2000s. They had soft and emotive songs and full of heart and yet edgy lyrics, and for many of the used fans, something to connect with. Yet they also had heavier, more metal riffs and screams in songs, allowing for a more comfortable crossover with the very early metalcore stylings of Avenge Sevenfold. A plus that the band also indulged in the eyeliner leather jacket aesthetic that they did during their early years. And lastly, they had a lot more outright punk sound to them than most other bands in this scene, mostly due to Frankie's influence, and it allowed for them to flirt with the more hardcore punk side of things that Every Time I Die dwelled in. This all contributed to why the band was able to anchor themselves as a bit of a cornerstone or center point of the whole Molgoth movement. While not the cornerstone just yet, they had the look, sounds, personalities, and stylings that made them more mass marketable to all the different niches within the alternative music scene. It also helps that I Brought You My Bullets was a pretty solid record, so... You know, I guess that did its thing, and also there's the whole MySpace invasion and the internet at large, but that, that's neither here nor there. The culmination of newfound fans through touring and overwhelming support and adoration of the local Jersey scene did a lot to give the band a solid foundation, and this would lead to even greater major label interest, as they had already been sought after since they were in their early days just starting out. Maybe the second week I was in the band, we went out for drinks with a major label. Yeah. Just because they were, we were signing from to Jersey. Jersey. Like, you couldn't walk down the street without a major label like coming out from an alley and trying to buy you a drink or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. From Jersey. And we're signed to Idol Records. There was such a signing frenzy going on. There was just major labels everywhere. Like, we played a show in a basement in Philly. Five people. One of which know. was a homeless... Uh, person who had like, yeah, bootlegged our set and then tried to sell us the tape afterwards. Yeah. Uh, and another one, <laughs> one of the people there was uh, an A&R from a major label. And let's just say that they had a bit of a aversion to major record labels trying to dig their claws into them. But in time, and after a few tours, the band would eventually relent and sign a deal with Reprise Records, mostly due to the fact that some of their tour friends such as The Used also resided on the label, and the deal that they were given allowed for them to maintain much of their creative freedom alongside much better distribution and funding for the records. So how did, how did my chemical romance end up on Reprise Records from Eyeball Records? I think uh, it's just, you're, you know, 
to tell a story of how this stuff happens, and and um, yeah, it's what I love to see the most from a band. They were on uh, an indie label, Eyeball Records, and they had put out a record on their own. They've been touring a lot uh, behind that and building a fan base of their own. And how did how did you guys come to meet? Did he come sign you? He flew out to CMJ in New York. We had long meetings and, and conversations, you know, me and the band over a long period of time. I think it took nine months. And was the, the reason why we prayed for any specific reason? Um, he signed less than Jake two times. He tried to sign Jimmy World twice. Um, all from moving different labels. So when he loves a band, there's nothing he'll fight for more than that band. And we saw that. You know, they spent a lot of time thinking about it and you know they were very careful. They were they wanted to do it at the right pace. And then eventually after uh, a lot of, um, you know, of really analyzing and saying if this is the right home for them, we were fortunate enough to, you know, to win their hearts and they signed with us. Signing with Reprise was a massive win for the band since when they brought them into the fold, many of the battles that new bands usually have to fight in order to get a decent footing was already won for them by this point. With the shitty distribution of bullets making MCR a bit of a cult phenomena, since it became so hard to get even just your hands on it, causing many of the new fans to instead just opt to buy t-shirts and band merch, making them a bit of a marketing machine and giving them an even more alluring mystique, since they're a band that was a little harder to listen to. But outside of all this underground success, there was something else brewing underneath it all, and at this time, most people outside the band probably wouldn't see it. And that's the thing that would sadly come to really define this era of the band beyond just their music and a, a different element we'll get to later. It's no secret that Gerard Way has had a long and storied history with drug abuse and alcoholism. I mean, some of the biggest songs off Bullets focused on that subject matter. So as the band made more money and played more shows, it allowed for him not only to indulge in his vices, but to become reliant as he needed these things to face the crowd and have the energy and confidence to do so. But also, it was the money coming in and the constant access to these vices that allowed him to sustain it. Now, this is by no means a rare story. It's the typical rock and roll tale, the addiction Ouroboros, if you will needing something to take the edge off to create and perform, only for the success to give them more access to that thing, and the two to pour gas on the fire until the artists either choose to find sobriety or join the 27 Club. Gerard was a hardcore alcoholic, and through his time with the band up to this point, had developed an appetite for some sweet, sweet booger sugar. And I think it's pretty obvious that that substance in particular is not best paired with a choice beverage of liquor. This over-reliance on narcotics and booze eventually began to take its toll on Gerard, who found friends in fellow addicts such as Burt McCracken, and I think this grunge article really sums it up best. To get over his extreme social anxiety, Gerard Way turned to cocaine and alcohol until he became completely dependent on the substance during Warp Tour in 2004. In an interview with Straight.com, the frontman described the dire situation he was putting himself in. I've always had a problem with drinking and mixing alcohol with pills, and started to get the best of me. So the same way I was functioning just to sing when we were doing the record, I functioned just to play shows when we did Warped. When Gerard's addiction became so severe that it nearly killed him while touring in Japan later that year, the singer was ready to seek help, and his bandmates fully supported him. Thankfully, this incident would be a wake-up call, and members of the band, as well as their management, would step in to facilitate his road to sobriety, though his struggle with substance would be ongoing until around 2007, and even rearing its head again in 2014. But that being said, these appetites and struggles would be ongoing during the writing and initial tours of the revenge era of the band, and as such, are important pieces of lore to get out on the table before we dissect the record proper. And speaking of which, I think maybe it's time we talk about just how this record came to be, 
and how it was recorded and written. Revenge is really the band. Bullets is the band trying to find itself. By the time we hit Revenge, we had really become my chemical romance. <laughs> It was a completely different ballgame. You know, we had this phase called pre-production. It was different. You showed up to this big studio, you know, it was a lot, like, money and, like, crazy equipment they had and microphones that cost more than your first car. What was your first car, you remember? It was a Subaru XT. It was silver. Never had to wash it. You know, it was very strange going from the first record you know, changing your own guitar strings. We had a lot of tools at our disposal this time. Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, a record that stands tall even next to the band's most famous work. This is the album that would come to define the band for most, as it was the debut for many people who weren't really locked into the underground or were only casually into the burgeoning post-hardcore scene of the time. The record was written in a similar fashion to the first, a loose concept record. Continuing the story of the Demolition Lovers, the lore behind this record is mostly about the partners who died in a violent shootout at the end of Bullets, only for the man in the relationship to end up in hell and the devil to reveal to him that his lover was still alive and that he can come back to her if he brings him the souls of a thousand evil men. But that's not exactly what we ended up getting. While the artwork reflects a story in all of its stunning, beautiful glory, the actual lyrics contained on the record fell much more in line with Gerard's real life and the struggles that he faced. Most importantly, the death of his grandmother. In November, me and Mikey had lost our grandma and that kind of changed the way the record went at that point. When Gerard and Mikey lost their grandma, like we're, you know, we're all family. She. She actually, um, her and, her, and uh, his grandfather had like a huge part in the band being where they are today. Like we would never have started touring if they hadn't. Like they bought us our first band, and we would have never started touring. So like when we, you know, when he experienced that loss, like we felt it too. So we were, you know, we were just like, yeah, this what this is what where the record needs to go. Gerard's grandparents were deeply supportive of the band during their formative years and were the ones that really would raise him and Mikey way. The news of her passing would end up hanging heavily over the band as a whole, and from here the entire record would begin to morph and change into something entirely different, becoming a far more personal record dealing with themes such as grief, relationships, alcoholism and substance abuse, and a whole host of other related issues. Though, to be fair to the band, it's not nearly as loose as, let's say, Bullets, where you had songs about Dawn of the Dead mixed in with its story, but most of the songs on Three Cheers are far more personal, with even the story tracks really bleeding more into that personal narrative of Gerard and his struggles. The music that accompanies this tale would also be a step up from Bullets, as this time around, the band wasn't working with a small budget in a cramped low-rent studio, relying on a lot of newcomers to the industry to create a record in a short amount of time. The budget reprise brought to the table allowed for them to record in a big studio setting, with famed producer Howard Benson, a man that would more or less make this entire record possible. Howard, he was the kind of guy that'll challenge you and even something that make you make you doubt, you know? He made a lot of references to, you know, what being in a band is like and even making the record like, um, what is it, like a basketball team. Yeah, like you know, like everybody, and stuff. Wow. Yeah, like everybody has, you know, a specific role. He would basically be like, you know, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> yeah, we'd, be, we'd come in and we'd be like, nah, dude, it's got this part that's like, ah. And he'd be like, what does that part mean? Howard was a professional. And with him at the helm, he would push the band beyond their limits and encourage their creativity above their technical abilities, giving suggestions that would end up defining songs. And the, uh, the way that we had originally arranged it was just the bridge into that heavy section and then the song ends. Howard pushed for having another chorus there. 
And we all hated having that chorus in that song. We thought that the song was done, not into it at all. Me and Gerard were listening to the version that Howard had suggested with that chorus after that heavy part. And, you know, the, the bridge plays and that heavy part comes in and then that last chorus kicked in and, and we just both, like, our eyes lit up and we just said, fuck, he's right. And along with Howard, the other big game changer of this record would actually be Frank, as he would have a much larger influence on this record. Because during their debut, he only contributed to two songs. Where here, his style would be much more apparent, and his writing would shine, providing melodies and riffs that contrasted well with Ray's style. Aside from the cleaner production and more mature songwriting, MyChem would also see a big shift in their core sound here as well, with a larger focus on hooks and catchy choruses, with pop elements more in focus than ever before. Along with that, the record is noticeably less heavy, still thrashing and harsh at times, but nothing really on the level of what came before. There was a lot more subdued here, but unlike other bands which feel like they lose their edge, here it just feels a lot more refined. A big part of this was due to the fact that Three Cheers was made with all the original members still in the band, hence why it doesn't again feel watered down or like there's a huge shift in the tone and atmosphere. And most of that's because drummer Matt Pelissier would actually return for the drum work on this album. A lot of people think that this is the debut of Bob Breyer, who would go on to be the most iconic percussionist of the band, but during his time here, he was little more than a hired gun for the road. But hey, it seems like we're just kind of dilly-dallying, and enough delaying the inevitable. What did the record sound like? From the word go, Three Cheers starts by firing on all cylinders, with what would come to be one of the most defining and influential songs the band would produce, Helena. And while it continued the fast punk rock sound of Bullets, it wastes no time in showing off their newest strength as well. Three Cheers is upfront with how much it relies on strong hooks and choruses, with almost every song containing an earworm aspect designed to get stuck in your head. Along with breaking more pop conventions, by saying something far more somber and relatable in its chorus. What's the worst that I can say? Things are better if I stay. So long and good night. So love your good night. It might not be Shakespeare, but it doesn't need to be. The lyrics are straightforward enough to define a relatable sense of grief, but vague enough to be applied to just about anyone's experience. Whether it be the loss of a loved one, the death of a family pet, or even the loss of a relationship. As mentioned previously, the album is split between a concept record and the real-life struggles Gerard faced at this point in his life with the loss of his grandma and his addictions being the most prominent personal themes to bleed into the lyrics. The album's second track, Give Him Hell Kid, is a good representation of this, as its chorus is vague enough to sound like another relatable hook about grief or a broken relationship. If you were here, I'd never have a fear. So go on, live your life, but I miss you more than I did yesterday. You're so far away, so come on, show me how because I mean this is more than words could ever say. Where the verses are distorted enough to where if you don't pay close attention, you won't realize that they're all about the album's protagonist just racking up his kills to get his lover back. So if you're looking for a very disciplined concept record, you're not really going to find it here. As far as the record go, it's more just flair and styling than anything else, with its narrative just being a little too loose. I mean, the next song really kind of throws the story to the side because the song to the end is very loosely about the protagonist crashing her wedding, but its lyrics are actually just an adaption of the short story, A Rose for Emily. This elevator only goes up to 10, He's not around, he's always looking at them. 
Down by the pool, he doesn't have many friends, as they are face down and bloated, a snapshot with the lens. A Rose for Emily is a tale penned by William Faulkner, which tells a story of a woman who's become mentally ill after the passing of her father, only to end up romantically involved and about to be wed by a man whose behavior leads Emily and others in her town to suspect that he's secretly gay. The story culminates in Emily buying an arsenic and killing him, only for the town to discover the recluse's crimes after she passes away many years later. Musically, it's one of the more subdued songs off the record, and it could be that the band wanted to make a statement with this tale, maybe about gay persecution or something like that, but as I said before, it's far removed from the rest of the record, both sonically and lyrically, barely having a connection to the Demolition Lover story, and even further away from the more personal themes of grief and substance abuse. Now, the next track we have is a far more famous one, and it's one I plan to talk about later, so we won't go super in-depth now, but it's the homoerotic masterpiece and duet between Gerard and Bert, You Know What They Do To Guys Like Us in Prison. The song is a masterpiece of flamboyance, with cutting lyrics and some of the best songwriting on the record, easily ranking among the album's best tracks. But it's quickly followed up by one of the band's even more famous songs. Now this was the Emo Kid Anthem, and coincidentally a song that delves even further away from the original point and story of the record. While Helena might have been the first song off the album, I'm Not Okay was the world's first taste of it, being the original single that they launched with. I'm Not Okay is a pop-laden emo anthem, with a chorus sung by sad emo kids and rich preps who dress up like it on the weekends everywhere. What will it take to show you that it's not the life it seems? I've told you time and time again, you sing the words but don't know what it means. To be a joke and look, another line without a hook. I held you close as we both shook, for the last time, take a good hard look. This song would end up being the theme to adolescent misfits everywhere, where it made you feel like you were seen and understood by a band you look up to. It's a song you loved as a cringy teenager because you thought it was way deeper than it actually was. And it's a track that you still love as a cringy adult because it's catchy as all hell. There's no mystery as to why the band chose this as their lead single. And it's a song that will probably sit in the musical history books as an example of what music from this era was like. But for all the praise I just gave, I'm not okay, it's peanuts compared to the album's next track, and my personal favorite from the band's entire discography, The Ghost of You. At the end of the world, or the last thing I see, you're never coming home, never coming home, could I, should I? and all the things that you never ever told me, and all the smiles that are ever ever. Just like Helena, The Ghost of You is a song that is vague enough to mean whatever you want it to mean, as it's a track about deep loneliness, regret, grief, and especially loss. From a story perspective, it's the protagonist missing his lover. From a real life standpoint, it's the gut-wrenching grief of Gerard missing his grandmother. On the music side, it's the album's peak, fusing its punk edge with the band's anthemic rock sound for the chorus and bridge, while creating this haunting wall of sound around the wailing and pained vocals of Gerard. It's simple, yet powerful, while the verses on the other hand take on a more ghostly and airy tone, with a lot of reverb and empty space to create a dark, melancholic atmosphere that's unmatched by any other song off the record. 
After this masterpiece, we are greeted with another legendary track. The Jets at Life is going to kill you. This song is all about addiction, from its title to its chorus. As we spoke about earlier, this era saw Gerard battling with his addictions, using both coke and booze to soothe the stress that came from living such a turbulent lifestyle on the road. Pull the plug, but I'd like to learn your name. When holding on, well I hope you do the same, oh sugar. Slip into the tragedy, you spun this chamber dry. While this can be misconstrued as yet another intoxicated love anthem, it's easy to see that Gerard is personifying his addiction as a lover, and the sugar line is more than likely a reference to the nose candy he was reliant on. Coincidentally, this track of despair is followed by one of malice, at least malice towards the band's detractors and critics. I'm not Thank You For The Venom is timeless, a song all about Gerard willingly poisoning himself for the audience while eschewing his role as a cult icon to the growing scene that MCR was heading at the time. The venom he's thanking us for being the fear and loathing that bathed the scene at the time. Though I'm sure he wasn't too happy when he became even more beloved as the king of this entire thing when the success of this record finally hit. Now, from here, Three Cheers begins a bit of a descent, not so much in its quality, but in its tone. It's beginning to get to the end of the record. And the first song to really set this in stone is the emo cowboy song, Hang Em High, following more lore for the album. And its next track is It's Not a Fashion Statement, It's a Death Witch, which again is more lore heavy, hinting at the conclusion of the album's story where our protagonist laments his lot and speaks of self-harm. While this may be Gerard's favorite track off the record, it's just kind of okay to me. It's one of the lesser cuts. It's still good, it's not bad by any means, uh, just not as impactful of what has really come before or even what comes after it. Now, the record's second to last track on the other hand, Cemetery Drive, is actually one of my favorites. It focuses more on clearing up the missing links in the story so far before the record comes to its end, as well as just being another catchy song. The lyrics tell of the protagonist's lover ending her life in the aftermath of the story's events only for her to end up in hell and the protagonist to mourn her passing. Back home, off the run, singing songs that make you rush your wrists. It isn't that much fun, staring down a loaded gun, so I won't stop dying, won't stop lying. If you want, I'll keep on crying. Did you get what you deserve? Is this what you always want me for? It's just a great lead up to the album's closer, as well as a song that's a bit more vibrant and upbeat than how we're going to end things. And speaking of the end, we've reached the record's conclusion. We have the song, I Never Told You What I Do For A Living. This song is the conclusion to the story of the past two records. The Demolition Lovers, or Bonnie and Clyde, have finally met their end as her protagonist realized that the final evil soul he had left to take was none other than himself. And in his acceptance of death, he accepts that he and his love could never stay together, and now they will roam hell in separation. It's a bit of a bitter end, but it is a bit of a bitter album. It's one marked with revenge and grief no less, and it's not a bad one either. Despite how pop-oriented or catchy it can be at times, Three Cheers is a very grief-stricken and bitter record, full of melancholy, spite, and anger. But it's also a record that's full of life and heart, something that stood as the peak of its era 
and a record that stands the test of time, not only as one of my own personal favorites, but as one that is still beloved by the greater rock scene. This labor of love would end up making the band into stars, and from here, they would begin to really take the world by storm. But it wasn't just the record that got them there. Once the marketing machine for this record got going, it wasn't long before MCR would find themselves at the top of the industry. So you know, maybe it's time we take a look at some of that marketing. I don't know how we feel about clashing with the Nintendo image. Um, I think the closest Nintendo thing we come close to is probably Resident Evil. I mean, which just happens to be my favorite game. But uh, um, yeah, it, it was really weird when they asked us. We were like, they know what the lyrics are like, right? And you know, but they really just wanted bands they liked on it, and they really didn't care too much about like what that band, as far as image wise, or what they projected. Um, All right, now something we really need to discuss here is just how important the marketing was for Revenge in terms of getting at the success that it had. And before you start to say, yeah, duh, Madison, we know marketing is important, blah, 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 I can't overstate enough just how key the exact way the band did their marketing played in the success of this record. The first and most visible change that the band went through was their aesthetic and fashion. Gone was the semi-grungy look of leather jackets and band shirts, with the band looking more like your average group of dudes just playing in a rock band, and in came the iconic black-clad emo boys that defined a generation. While their original look was fine, it just wasn't anything special that would really stand out from the crowd. They really did just kind of look like your average group of Jersey rockers. So when they would eventually rebrand themselves into what can best be described as a 90s comic book come to life, it really did set them apart from the pack. They would wear a mixture of corporate dress clothing, police equipment, and 80s goth makeup. And even their haircuts were more than just your typical emo swoop of the time, looking more influenced by 70s punk and anime of all things. And while it might seem really extra and over the top, this look would prove to be extremely successful for them, as it really did separate them from much of the other bands in the scene that looked like this, or like this. You either had average dudes, hipsters, or your average MySpace emo kids. And their more theatrical look went really well with their more theatrical approach to the music, the lyrics, and even the stage show. And inadvertently, their look really helped them bleed in and grow with the growing anime fandom of the time, the 2000s Tim Burton craze that would come to define that era, and like I said, looking like a 90s comic book. It allowed them to appeal to all these different demographics that most of the other bands of their ilk just weren't hitting. And in many ways, they mirrored that of Avenged Sevenfold, who would go with a similar approach, albeit a, their own unique take and their own unique demographics that they would entice with. It's something that only really a handful of bands outside of Avenged and MyChem would really be able to capitalize on without just looking like a bunch of clowns attempting to live in the shadow of the past. <laughs> but where things really shined for MyChem, was the music videos that the band produced to support the record, and they played probably the most important role in getting them the attention that they deserved. Helena has a world-famous video for a reason, and the videos produced for this record at large were far more intricate and grand, and even cinematic, than what most other bands of this era had to offer. Helena was a beautiful and theatrical piece, it includes well-choreographed ballet sequences and a beautiful Catholic church, depicting a funeral for a loved one. And Gerard's exaggerated and meme-worthy faces contrasting with the serious and artsy tone of the video only accentuated the charm and likability of the whole production. Again, it carried a very Tim Burton vibe to the entire thing, and 
I can't stress enough how important that crossover of fans would be for the band. I mean, hell, only a few years later, Frank would end up doing some music for one of his films. But hey, I've jumped a bit ahead. We can't ignore the first single off the record that received a music video, and that would be the timeless pop rock hit, I'm Not Okay, I Promise. As we already discussed, the song itself is a timeless hit that encapsulates the 2004 rock sound perfectly. But its music video was a fit of true brilliance. You like D&D, Audrey Hepburn, Fangoria, Harry Houdini, and Croquet. You can't swim, you can't dance, and you don't know karate. Face it, you're never gonna make it. I don't wanna make it. I just wanna. Framing the whole thing as a teen comedy film was genius. The early to mid 2000s was flooded with these sorts of films. So making a parody for them as a idea for a music video was destined to be a success. And look, it might seem dated and cheesy now, and it really is in all honesty, but at the time there was no better idea to hit at the masses, and with the catchy pop-centric nature of the song itself, and the alluring aesthetic of the band performing in it, it would become a massive bit of success for the band even awarding them a spot on Fuse's 25 Greatest Videos list. Now, the final video that I really want to speak on is one that sits as both the band's best for what is arguably also the best song on the record. At least it's my favorite. And that is The Ghost of You. The Ghost of You's video was ambitious and left field compared to everything that the band had produced up to that point making a compelling and theatrical narrative of World War II soldiers storming Omaha Beach, a homage and mirror of many of the scenes from the late 90s classic Saving Private Ryan, which was still a very popular film during this time. And the World War II setting also inadvertently served as a gateway for many gamers at the time to find the band, as during the mid-2000s, series like Medal of Honor, Brothers in Arms, and especially Call of Duty during its early years were making massive waves in the industry as the premier World War II shooters, creating yet another path to new fans for the band. And the way the video plays out a tragic and beautiful story, where we see that all these men had to leave their wives and families to fight a war only to watch as their dear friends die in the invasion, specifically Mikey, who was seen as the quiet and kind soul of the band to be the one to do so, it left a pretty powerful mark on those who watched it at the time. And it just served as another key piece of the puzzle and how My Chemical Romance took the world by storm. Now, all these videos, and especially the aesthetic and all the various demographics of people that it would connect with served as the band's gateway to success, being able to finally leave the shadows of the underground and enter the angelic light of the mainstream. Popping was a very deceptive thing. It, at first, you feel like it's, oh, this is nothing. I mean, it doesn't have a body in it, but you're like, oh, this is nothing, you know? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it feels like you're holding like a coffee table by yourself. I think certain people just let go at certain Yeah, and it's, don't, if, if you keep a good eye, you'll notice that Frank is too short to actually carry them. I hear it's heavy. I'm about 4'9", so when they lift the coffin, it's actually above my head and I'll actually get to lift it. I'm just touching it. So he was just kind of like the, the, walking underneath. He was no help at all. <laughs> and I think that's why me and Gerard would feel the brunt of the pain because we're up front. And the front's Thanks, the Frank. Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge would be the album that put the band on the map for many. It took much of what Bullets did and refined it into something far greater than the sum of its parts, with an added budget and talented producer taking the band sound to even higher levels. And the success of the singles and popularity of the music videos would go to great lengths in turning MCR into a household name. This was the record that would serve as the cornerstone of the mid-2000s Molgoth explosion, racking up more and more fans and giving the whole Warp Tour scene a much more mainstream appeal than many of its other titans at the time, 
and served as an entry point for much of the emo culture to get into the public eye to begin with. 2004 was a pivotal year for that scene, seeing releases and big successes from bands like Under Oath, From First to Last, The Used, and many others. The band would receive a documentary, one that I've used very liberally for this series so far, just cataloging their early days and the making of Three Cheers, and that would be Life on the Murder Scene. While there are fan pieces at this point that are much more in-depth than this, Life on the Murder Scene is still a fun and interesting look into the band's early days and their day-to-day -day lives of the time. And it was yet another element that would bring a lot of life and acclaim to the band. By telling their story and giving fans a peek at the ragtag group of musicians that they idolized at a time where YouTube didn't exist and early social media really only let you know the bare minimum. And so something like Life on the Murder Scene would humanize them in a way that most other bands had never really been able to do for themselves. And just a year after Three Cheers' release, even Bullets would see a reissue providing new fans with even more music to sink their teeth into, all while MCR saw themselves playing bigger and bigger tours, and invited on show after show to market themselves even more to the world at large. The reason I called this video the revenge of my chemical romance was because that's kind of what this was. This was the band coming back after their first record with a vengeance, out to prove that they were far more than what they were perceived as, taking all of what they had and amplifying it into one of the most key and influential moments of rock music in the last 30 years, etching themselves as a pivotal band for the world at large, as early as their second record. Though if I'm being honest, it still wouldn't really prepare the masses for what would come next. But hey, with all that being said, let me introduce you to my supporters. This is the Wall of Shame, a place that houses the names of those foolish enough with their finances to believe in little old me. Their support is what keeps this channel going as videos like this are never monetized. And the amount of time and effort that goes into them can often outweigh my real life big boy job. So if you would like to join them and get your name up here or just show some support for what I do, throw me a sub on Patreon or give me a dono on coffee. I couldn't be more grateful for the support and it means the world. And look, there's only one way of saying this. The more of you that come and give me that moolah, the quicker I get to do this full time. So if you would like to see that, go ahead and show me some support. But with that, Subscribe, follow me on Twitter, check out the Discord server, link in description, and I'll see you in the next video.